So um, H. pylori, also known as um, Campylobacter pyloridus, um, is a is a so H. pylori is an infection that's actually um, has a fair few consequences of it and is associated um, with chronic gastritis, um, peptic ulcer disease, gastric adenocarcinoma, and uh, gastric mucosa associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma also known as malt lymphoma. And um, interestingly enough, um, H. pylori was first kind of ignored in the old days, um, apart from with malt lymphoma, and that was really the only link um, until two Australian doctors in Perth um, actually drank uh, liquid with H. pylori. Um, those doctors were Dr. Barry Marshall and Dr. Robin Warren and actually showed that the H. pylori itself called um, peptic ulcers, uh, kind of challenging the uh, belief at the time that they thought that you get ulcers in the stomach, mainly from stress, uh, spicy foods and too much acid. And um, they received the Nobel prize for this in 2005. So a little, little bit more about H. pylori. Um, it's the most common chronic bacterial infection found in humans to date. And most people actually get it at a, at a younger age. And um, there's been multiple studies done that actually show um, most people that have H. pylori get infected before the age of five years. Um, the reason why this has happened and the mechanism behind this is actually quite debated uh, at present. And it's still not really, um, proven how it is, um, but the main transmission is believed to be by the fecal oral or oral, oral roots. However, this hasn't been proven. Uh, once someone gets infected with H. pylori, um, they might actually have it for many, many, many decades, and they may or may not get any uh, symptoms, uh, and some of them can have it lifelong without any ulcers forming. Um, most commonly, H. pylori seems to be associated with uh, individuals from African-American descent, Hispanic descent, and native Alaskans, um, compared to Caucasian population. The risk of getting H. pylori um, seems to be strongly correlated with someone's socioeconomic status and living conditions at a very young age. So people living in very close proximities and, and being in overcrowding, um, the amount of siblings you have, and if you're sharing a bed with someone else and difficulties with, with clean, fresh water, um, all these factors have been associated um, with an increased risk of H. pylori infection. Um, the way they kind of figured this out and, and got evidence behind this was um, with Japan. So in Japan, um, up to 80% of the adult population that were born before 1950, so around World War II, um, were infected with H. pylori. However, only 45% of the individuals born between 1950 and 1960, and only 25% of those born between 1960 and 1970, were shown to be infected. So it showed a, a, a rapid decline of infection rates in individuals, um, which was attributed to Japan's um, economic progress and improvement, improvement in uh, sanitary um, after the World War II. H. pylori. Um, can cause reinfection, however, it's quite unlikely. And current data shows that H. pylori following a successful cure with antibiotics is very unusual. And the current rate of that is less than 2% of persons per year, which is a similar rate to people actually getting the initial infection. So basically, once you have it treated, the chance of it coming back are the same as someone that has never had it before. So what is, I don't know, what do I find interesting about H. pylori and what makes it such an interesting 
bacteria is a little bit about the properties of H. pylori. So it's spiral shaped. It is microaerophilic. It is gram negative. It produces urease. Lots of subspecies produce catalase and it has specific adhesion receptors. And on the high pyre microscope, it actually shows it has two to seven sheeted flagella that help it move. Furthermore, um, H. pylori is able to form cocoid forms outside the body and being able to survive for many, many years in both uh, feces and water, especially stagnant water. So what makes H. pylori so ideal to live in the stomach under the harsh conditions that exist there? So probably most important is the urease that it produces. Uh, the urease itself hydrolyzes urea that's in the gut to form ammonia, which helps neutralize gastric acid and protects the H. pylori bug um, from the acid around it and kind of allow it to penetrate up to the gastric mucus layer. And bacterial urease activity is clinically important because it allows us um, to do certain testing, such as a urea bread test. The shape of the bug, given its spiral shape with a flagella, it allows passage through the mucus layer quite easily to the gastric surface epithelium. And on that epithelium, there are certain specific receptor receptors that the bug adheres to. And these receptors are different between individuals and strains, which explains why some people are more prone to H. pylori, uh, certain H. pylori strains compared to others. And then the catalase it produces is to help neutralize the damage by reactive oxygen metabolites, which neutrophils nearby will liberate. Furthermore, of important note is that H. pylori doesn't actually get into the gastroduodenal tissue. Instead, what it does, it creates kind of an environment that allows the acid in the stomach to penetrate and hit the underlying mucosa, causing acid peptic damage, disrupting the mucus layer. And the host immune response, so the body then trying to infect, uh, to clear the H. pylori, creates a cascade of further inflammation, leading to further injury. This chronic inflammation caused by the H. pylori upsets the gastric acid secretion in different stages. And this kind of leads to the chronic inflammation of the gastric lining or gastritis. Now, most people might get a small ache, but kind of ignore it and it doesn't seem to progress and it kind of stays where it is. However, in some individuals, this altered secretion and including uh, an ongoing tissue injury leads to a peptic ulcer forming. While in some other cases, the ongoing inflammation leads to atrophy and then metaplasia of the intestinal mucosa, which can lead to gastric carcinoma, or in some cases, the persistent immune stimulation of this can lead to that malt lymphoma. And I have this slide coming up. Here we go. It kind of explains that. So you have, if you look at the first points, you have the gastric fluid, and then you have the mucus layer, which the H. pylori goes through, then sits at the epithelial cell, where it produces lots and lots of urease, creating a nice and neutral environment. And then it replicates, as you can see, and it creates this nice environment that basically eventually allow the gastric fluid from this part here to basically invade, and cause inflammation and damage to the mucus. And then you get all these leukocytes involved as well, which increase the risk of that malt lymphoma. And I think this is quite a nice picture to explain that all. Now, apart from the treatments we know, there's actually um, done some studies with trying to do vaccination and seeing if we can vaccinate people against H. pylori. And there was a randomized phase three trial recently done that used almost four and a half thousand H. pylori uninfected children, so people that did not have H. pylori between the ages of six to 15 years. And they got a three dose oral H. pylori vaccine or a placebo in a one-to-one -one ratio. And actually showed the vaccine to be 
efficient in up to 72% of cases. Among the patients who completed the extended follow-up over many, many years, the H. pylori continued to be lower in the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated children. However, protection levels were lower in the second and third year after the vaccine. And it showed that the vaccine actually reduces every year with efficiency. In regards to side effects, there were no serious adverse events related to the vaccine. And there was only a mild increase of nausea and vomiting in the vaccine arm compared to the placebo arm. Unfortunately, this is still going for long-term follow-up to see it's feasible to create a quite expensive vaccine for this condition. So the most important part is you have a patient, you're concerned that they might have H. pylori. When do you actually test for it? So first and foremost, you only test if you're actually planning on treating and, and whether you're planning on treating this patient. So if you have a patient that even if they're positive is not going to get treatment, then it's of course uh, redundant to do this. So I've kind of tried to collect codes when you check for H. pylori. So in the most important case, anyone that has peptic ulcer disease or a history of peptic ulcer disease in the past, and there's been no clear documentation whether H. pylori has been cured or has been occurred in the past, they need to get a H. pylori test. Furthermore, anyone with mild lymphoma diagnosis needs a H. pylori test and urgent treatment for that to treat the H. pylori to prevent worsening of the lymphoma. Furthermore, anyone with gastric cancer needs a H. pylori test. The one in the yellow or orange here is a little bit more complex and there's no evidence either way whether it's beneficial or not. So anyone with dyspepsia that is less than 60 years old can be considered for H. pylori testing. And of course, anyone over 60 should get an upper endoscopy. Any commencement of long-term MSH or low-dose aspirin um, here in Australia, we don't routinely test for H. pylori for someone that has been on NSAID or low-dose aspirin for a prolonged period of time. There's actually no clear evidence whether it's uh, beneficial or not. And currently it's kind of clinician dependent. The same goes for iron deficiency anemia. And there's actually a strong link that individuals that have idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura are quite often H. pylori positive as well but it's a little bit of a chicken and egg, which ones came first, and, and there's currently no evidence of that. Um, there is no evidence whatsoever that it's beneficial to take people for H. pylori if they have any family members, whether it's immediate or distant family members with gastric cancer, anyone with lymphocytic gastritis, hyperplastic gastric polyps, or hyperemesis gravidarium. Furthermore, what tests can we actually do to check for H. pylori? So there's multiple tests that can be done, but realistically, there should only be three tests that should be done. So the two non-invasive ones are the urea breath test or the stool antigen test. And then invasive-wise, we can test via endoscopy. But those are your only three options. Do not use any of the other tests if they, not, they do not show benefit. Furthermore, as in red, you can see below here, do not do any of these tests if this patient has been on a PPI in the last two weeks or any antibiotics, no matter which one, in the last four weeks. So if you treat H. pylori, you actually go to wait four weeks after you have finished the antibiotics before you test again for H. pylori eradication. And it's actually really important that all patients treated for H. pylori should have confirmation of eradication because of the increasing antibiotic resistance in the community. So in regards to treatments, first and foremost, any patient that has an H. pylori infection should be treated. Now the complex part is there's so many options to treat it. Which one do you actually use? Especially given increased macrolide resistance and a lot of patients in Australia, and I'm sure with you guys as well, have a penicillin allergy. 
So there's some things to think about before you consider treatments is what allergies do they have? And is it an actual true allergy? Or, you know, is it a little bit of nausea when they were a child? You can, you can kind of use your clinical guidance on that one. And furthermore, are there any histories of any macrolide resistance in this patient, um, which kind of makes you steer away from medications? Now, these are the guidelines on the left side that are recommended in Australia. And these are the guidelines on the right side that are recommended by UpToDate. So the one in Australia we use on the left side is the first line therapy is by using esomeprazole twice a day for seven days, amoxicillin one gram twice a day for seven days, and then chlorithromycin twice a day for seven days. Now, unfortunately, these are quite old guidelines in Australia, and they have not been updated in the last 15 years. And all the studies that kind of came up with this consensus and provided this evidence are all from prior to 2010. So it's not very up-to-date medication. In Australia, especially, we're getting increased rates of levofloxacin resistance. So we try and avoid that in Australia to use um, unless the H. pylori strain has been cultured and is known to be sensitive to levofloxacin. However, of note of that, um, it is noted that levofloxacin resistance is very prevalent um, in Europe, Australia, and the United States. But I've looked at some data on PubMed, and there seems to be very low rates of levofloxacin resistance with H. pylori in Southeast Asia and in South um, America. So I think for you guys, it is something to consider levofloxacin, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. In regards to the first line therapy here with clarithromycin, I'm a big fan of not using clarithromycin, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit further why I think that, but there's been many, many studies done uh, in Australia and other countries um, of increasing rate of clarithromycin uh, resistance uh, H. pylori and in Europe, East Mediterranean and Western regions, the rates of primary clarithromycin resistance was sometimes over 50%. So that's five, zero percent. So it means half of the H. pylori was basically resistant to clarithromycin. And some studies done in Australia actually recently on patients with known H. pylori via endoscopy. So this is, you got to kind of think about it. You have a little bit of a biased population because these were patients that need an endoscopy for multiple indications. But you do got to think about it. They showed up, up to 90% of resistant clarithromycin. And I'm not sure what the resistant rates are in Burma, but over the whole world, there seems to be more and more increased rate of clarithromycin. And in... Um, vitro in the lab, um, exposure of clarithromycin even for quite a short time to H. pylori seems to cause a lot of resistant increases. So there's kind of a, a little bit of background thinking that maybe this, this initial therapy we recommended worked for quite a long time purely because of the amoxicillin and the isomeprazole there rather than the clarithromycin. If you look at the up-to-date guidelines, which are mainly based on the United States, the, the way they look at H. pylori is if they basically had any prior macrolides in the past, so if they had clarithromycin for anything in the past, or if the clarithromycin resistant in the local area are greater than 50%, you kind of follow that as a guideline. And if there is any reason to think there might be macrolide resistance, they jump straight to quadruple therapy. And I'll go to the Australian guidelines for that in a second. All right, so this talks a little bit about salvage therapy in Australian guidelines, but I kind of use it here as a, also as a, um, as a guideline for us to show what other types of therapy are out there. And this is probably the main one I would recommend at the moment uh, in Australia and uh, potentially in Burma as well, given you don't get to use the clarithromycin. Um, Levofloxacin is a little bit more difficult in Australia to get, um, but most hospitals can get access to it. And then amoxicillin is readily available and has very good activity against H. pylori. And we always need a proton 
pump inhibitor. Now, of note, this is the guideline from Australia if the previous therapy on this page has failed. You try this as a second line. Now, what you should notice that it says for 10 days, or well, the previous one says seven days. And I'll jump in this in a second. There's actually um, a moderate evidence-based guideline, so it's not very strong, but it's actually suggestive now that we aim more for 14 days rather than seven or 10, especially if the patient can tolerate this. Now, ideally, I personally recommend this one if you have access to levofloxacin or otherwise use the quadruple therapy here below as, as one of the guidelines Australia recommend. But I would be considerate of the metronidazole at the bottom and potentially change that for moxicillin. And I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. But basically, moxicillin and tetracycline have the best activity against H. pylori. And bismuth is fantastic if you can get your hands on it. However, I don't know if any of you have ever tried it. It is quite unpleasant to take for the patient. And we'll have to consider um, whether they're going to be adherent or not, especially given that they take it four times a day. So you really got to pick your patient. If you have a, have a highly intelligent, motivated patient that you think will stick to, you know, a tablet of a proton pump inhibitors, then you know, up to, depending what strength the bismuth comes in, they either come in 60 or 120 here. You're talking about another potentially eight tablets, then another four tablets, and then another three or four tablets, depending if you use metronidas or moxicillin. You're talking about, you know, quite a large amount of tablets, and especially in young people, you have to consider whether they're actually going to be adherent or not. Um, and then finally, uh, we try and use this in Australia basically as the last line therapy because we, the rifibutin is kind of our last line of defense in Australia for a lot of infections. Um, and what we aim to do is basically only leave that for people as a last line defense, given the increasing rates of resistance. So I think someone is drawing on the screen. I don't know if they're trying to ask something. Um, uh, screen for Mali was drawing long, yeah. Dr. La Unten. Sorry, Shaws, I think someone might be doing it. No, that's all right. We'll just yeah. go to the next. Should okay. be right. As long as everyone sorry. 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 Yeah. No, no, don't stress. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. Uh, okay. We'll go to the next next page anyways. Um, Hello, uh, I think I think we can still see it. Should be okay. Um so I've just taken you guys to the Australian guidelines, and this is the American guidelines. If if someone has tried, you know, triple therapy with chlorithromycin um, base with chlorithromycin in it, or if they've tried the bismuth quadruple therapy, and you're trying to think, okay, that didn't work. We've waited four weeks after their last antibiotics. They've not had a PPI for two weeks, and then you test them again, and the test comes back that they still have H pylori. You kind of follow this 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 guideline this this path down. So if they've had chlorithromycin based triple therapy and they're allergic to penicillin, you can try the bismuth quadruple therapy. Personally, that doesn't make any sense because if someone had a penicillin allergy, they should have never been on the clarithromycin-based triple therapy. But these are the up-to-date guidelines. I didn't write them. Um, and if they don't have a triple therapy, they kind of leave it in your hands. And they talk about this high-dose dual therapy, um, which is basically amoxicillin only at high doses. Uh, and sometimes people use up to two grams four times a day with a PPI twice a day, um, or just levofloxacin, which we spoke about before, or the, the bismuth. Now, if someone tried the bismuth for droplet therapy, you can do, then either treat it with, again, bismuth for droplet therapy, with basically double the strength of a PPI, or you can switch to levofloxacin triple therapy. And these are the American guidelines. I'm a big fan that if you've tried one therapy, the bismuth quadruple therapy, 
I wouldn't repeat it by just increasing the dosage of a PPI. You're kind of trying to treat the same thing over and over again the same way, expecting a different result, which I personally don't believe in. If it didn't work once, it won't work a second time. So we just try something different. So I personally then recommend we head towards the levofloxacin triple therapy. And then if they do have a pellets in SVG, it goes basically down the same ones we spoke before. And all of these therapies are explained at the bottom. All right, so I kind of spoke about the chloritromycin and, and its resistant levels and how we shouldn't use it. So this is a little bit of research done in Australia with our local pathology center um, in Australia. We have multiple, and this is, this is one of them. And they went through all the H. pylori testing they did between 2012 and 2018. Now we've got to remember that a few of these samples um, were taken endoscopically, and there was generally some sort of indication to have that endoscopy done. So not all of these were primary H. pylori infections. So some of these might have been on H. pylori for quite some time. Uh, sorry, had H. pylori for quite some time. They might have tried multiple therapies, and none of them worked. And then they kind of cultured it and, and looked for resistant levels. So this data is a little bit biased, but I think what's Good about this data is this basically goes over a prolonged period of H. pylori testing. It shows what the resistance is to H. pylori. Most importantly, it shows that amoxicillin and tetracycline have very low resistant levels. And they quite commonly use medications. Most people have quite easy access to them. So sometimes a good first line therapy, even, is just plain amoxicillin and tetracycline with a PPI for two weeks and to see how that goes. Now, this data here, if you look at the levofloxacin, it's, it's last on in 2018. And unfortunately here in Queensland where we live, there's actually increased levofloxacin resistance now, which is quite strange given how difficult it is to get our hands on levofloxacin, only really in hospital we can get it. Um, and as you can see, rifampicin quite quickly builds resistance to it despite little use. And as previously mentioned, there's very high levels of clarithromycin and metronidazole resistance. Interestingly, there's been a few studies done. And even if H. pylori is resistant to metronidazole, um, given metronidazole to these patients, even though they have metronidazole resistance, she'll show uh, clearance rates that are very similar to patients treated on, for example, moxicillin and tetracycline with susceptibility. And they can't fully explain it, but I think it might be some of the other effects metronidazole has that aren't antibiotic. But I think they're still doing some research on this. So this is a quite a busy slide, but I kind of try and summarize of where the difficulties are in, in H. pylori and some, some strong statements of what we should consider. Um, so there's a, a group of European doctors and they hold this, this um, conference every three years, either in the Netherlands or in um, Italy, in Florence. And as you can see, it's called the Maastricht, which is a town in the Netherlands. Uh, v because it's the fifth conference they have, uh, Florence Consensus, and that Florence is a town in Italy, and they just call that because they alternate where it is. This is published in 2016 and was meant to be uh, revised in 2020. Fortunately, COVID um, kind of stopped all these doctors coming together and they try to, you know, not mingle and mix. So they put it on hold of now, but there's plans of having this conference again or this, this workshop uh, this year again. And what basically happens is um, there's a few infectious disease specialists, a uh, few gastroenterologists um, and other doctors with, with an interest in H. pylori that, that come together and they go through all the, all the research um, published uh, in the last X amount of years. So if they have it now, it will be the last six years. And they form uh, different working groups over, over the days. And they go through all the evidence and then they go 
through the clinical expertise and, and what they have seen in practice and, and kind of show what their recommendations are. And, and they kind of make a couple of statements as, I, as I've shown here, um, which I think are important ones. But if you have time, I recommend you have a bit of a read through this, through this paper, um, if you can find it online. Um, but basically what, what one of their statements is, if, if, if there's clarotromycin resistance less than 15%, um, you can, you know, consider using clarotromycin based therapy. Um, you can rec they recommend you can uh, do antimicrobial susceptibility testing after uh, the first treatment failed. However, the level of evidence is quite weak, but they strongly recommend it. And it's also partially to keep data in your local community of, of resistance. Um, they go into this new uh, guideline or recommendation of, as, as I showed previously, even the guidelines in Australia still recommend seven or 10 days of treatment, but I actually strongly recommend we extend this to, to 14 days. Um, even though for most antibiotic treatments, we try and reduce the amount of, of therapy people get to try and reduce resistance. Um, there's, there's, there's a strong recommendation with, with moderate level of evidence to actually give 14 days of, of PPI um, plus antibiotic therapy for um, H. pylori treatments. Um, their statement is that currently we give PPI, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and for example, metronidazole together. Uh, uh, hello, hello, Shaw. Uh, sorry yes. for interruptions. Sorry. No, uh, no. So can 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 you off yours or share screen and reshare your screen? Uh, of course. And I think it will be okay. So I'm trying to contact Dr. Lau. Oh, good. Um. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Probably you can share it again and see if it is. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, thank you. No, I'll see if this works. Fantastic. Is that better? Yeah, much better. Thanks. No worries. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. No, no problem. And then we'll kind of go to this last statement, which I think is quite an important one from this paper is that in areas of high clarithromycin resistance, uh, we should consider bismuth quadruple or non-bismuth quadruple uh, therapies. And in areas where there's both clarithromycin and metronidazole resistance, uh, which unfortunately is, is Australia, uh, especially here in Queensland, they recommend bismuth quadruple therapy as the first line treatment. So rather than again, going back to what I, what I showed previously what the Australian guidelines show, this is actually the recommended first line treatment. And I'm currently trying to get some data here in Australia to see how often um, our primary care physicians actually um, fail to successfully treat H. pylori uh, with the first line treatment. Um, and, and current data shows that actually a lot of them uh, do not successfully treat and then either don't treat at all because the patient, you know, had a PPI for a couple of weeks, they kind of feel better and get lost to follow up. Um, or they refer to either infectious diseases or our gastroenterology colleagues. I think it's quite important. We also think about tolerability. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few studies done on this. And there was a large study done that showed 50% um, of all patients that were taking any kind of therapy for H. pylori. So whether it was triple therapy, quadruple therapy, bismuth, non-bismuth, metronidazole, clarithromycin, whatever they were taking, about 50% had side effects and, and a total of 10% actually stopped taking their medications completely because of the side effects were quite significant. So with these kind of patients, we really got to tell them that um, it's very uncomfortable for some of them for two weeks to take all these tablets, right? So it's a large quantity of tablets um, that, you know, come with it with a cost. Uh, it's very inconvenient. And then they also come with side effects. So it's quite important we educate these people how important it is to keep taking their tablets, uh, especially for that two-week period. 
um, to try and eradicate this so we don't have to continuously treat it and, and risk all those consequences that I've mentioned previously. Um, interestingly enough, there's actually some uh, potential treatments out there that, that have moderate uh, evidence and that are currently under investigations. So I'm sure you guys have the same that, that, that we love statins, right? They, they cure everything these days. Um, but there's actually um, been some studies done that show there's some um, reduced H. pylori inflammation of the gastromucosa and that actually leads to increased eradication of the H. pylori and lower levels of associated cancers with the H. pylori. Um, however, these are done with very small volume patients and they actually want to done like very, very large when I'm talking about 20, 30,000 patients. Um, but it's quite hard to get funding for this all the statins are like cheap now and not on uh, um, on patents anymore. So we'll we'll see if if someone will do these these studies in the future. Um, there's also been a few studies done on probiotics, and there's some that show that some probiotics might have an inhibitory effect on H. pylori. Um, there's also some evidence that um, probiotics will help with compliance, so people are having less side effects with the antibiotics. Um, for H. pylori treatments. But again, the evidence for this is quite weak, but there was quite a good meta-analysis done that I can link to you guys that where they included 10 clinical trials that used some sort of probiotic. Unfortunately, it wasn't the same one and it wasn't comparing head to head per se, but they used some sort of probiotic in patient with H. pylori. And then actually uh, this meta-analysis showed that there was a quite significant increase of cure rates and a reduced side effect profile in patients who receive probiotic supplements um, versus placebo. Um, the unfortunate um, thing is these, these studies that were included in the meta analysis uh, were quite of high risk of bias because no, not all of them were um, placebo controlled appropriately, as in, yes, they would have placebo but they weren't always um, blinded. Sometimes the patients were taught, no, no, sorry, you get placebo and, and you get the actual probiotic. Um, and there was such a strong difference between probiotics used from one study to another that it's quite hard to um, determine which ones were effective and which ones were not. And there's also this other new medication that's, that's slowly making its way to most countries, uh, Vonoprezen. Uh, we do not have it in Australia, and I believe you guys do not have it in Burma either. Um, but this is a new medication that, that is similar to a proton pump in there, but it's, it's much more effective. It's a potassium competitive acid blocker. You can kind of read up on that, but it stops the potassium pump in the gut. Um, and they've done some studies that, that uses this with amoxicillin and clarithromycin. Um, despite me not liking clarithromycin, there's actually quite strong evidence that the eradication rates with this um, medication plus amoxicillin and clarithromycin are, are much, much, much larger uh, compared to standard therapy. Um, and unfortunately, this medication isn't really available outside some countries in Asia, um, and we're still waiting on approval here in Australia. But hopefully over the next five or 10 years, we might see this medication a lot more for multiple different indications. And I think that's it, guys. Any questions? Thank you, Shaw, for your very informative presentations. No worries. So it's time for Q and A sessions. Mm -hmm. You can add to your questions in chat box as well as by muting your bytes. Thank you. 
so he has questions sure uh what are preparations before Sharia practice? Yeah, so I don't actually know uh, fully. I'm, I'm, we're quite lazy here in Australia. I can, um, I can just send someone to... to the lab and they they do it. But they basically breed in this preparation that that contains urea and has a has a carbon marker, and then they breed it in and then they just measure it. As far as I'm, as far as I know, yes. Unless you you know differently. Yeah, I mean, yes, you're right. I mean, we just need to send to the lab here normally. But yeah, before the urea breath test, what the patient has to do is, like Shaw has already mentioned before, so you have to uh, stop taking PPI for at least two weeks because you don't want to get false negative. And yes, if you are going to uh, test for eradication, right, so make sure that you, you wait for four weeks before you retest that. Otherwise, it will come back positive again. That's all that we normally, you know, like tell the patient because here, the lab normally would directly contact the patient. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So here's another question. Is there any rule of serology test for H. pylori? No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, it shows that they've been had some sort of reaction to H. pylori at some point in their life. Um, but there's there's very very little evidence that it that it does any good, and then, and here in Australia there's actually more harm from it than not. Because there's unfortunately some people that continue to treat it because the serology keeps coming back positive, but it will mm -hmm. once once it's positive it shouldn't shouldn't go back negative again. Yeah. It is a you know like IgG, so you know it will stay in your your system forever. So you know. Particularly, you know, we are from Burma, so in our, our H. pylori incident is quite high. So a lot of people, we have already been exposed to H. pylori. So we already have that antibody. So there is no point of checking the IgG. So like Shaw has mentioned before, if you want to confirm the diagnosis, you either test the urea breath test or figure antigen. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, here's another question. What do you want? PPI was the best use in H. pylori treatment. Yeah, so they've done uh, a few studies actually on this, um, and and basically the result of this is is the, I guess higher dose or the stronger the PPI, the better. Um, of course, higher doses increase risk of side effects, but PPIs are generally well tolerated. Um, and currently, it would be isomeprazole. Uh, 40 milligrams twice a day would be at, at high dose would be your your best option yeah. and also just uh bearing in mind that you know like ppi have like a different bio uh, mechanism as well so some people you know in the long term i mean particularly so they may not respond well to a type of a kind of ppi like as omeprazole but they may do better on rabiprazole or you know lensuprazole or different type of ppi so I think, yeah, as omeprazole 40 milligram BD is a very good dose. Okay, uh, thank you. So another question is, what's your opinion on H. pylori's true antigen test? Could it be used after eradication therapy to no resistance? So to the first part, I think the stool antigen test or the urea breath test, um, personally, I use whichever one is available and whichever one is cheaper, both of them are, are fantastic. Um, in regards to the second part of the questions, you can use it four weeks after therapy has been stopped to know if it was successful, um, but you would never know the resistant levels. The, real, the, real, the way of getting H. pylori resistance is, is basically with endoscopy and, and um, samples sent to the lab. So we do, yeah, we do that, you know, like endoscopic biopsy, biopsy of the gastric entral or, you know, uh, either duodenal biopsy and we, we check for the H. pylori and MCNS, culture and sensitivity. And we, we will be able to identify which antibiotics they are resistant to. Yeah. We don't do it routinely, only after they have failed for the, you know, like uh, first line therapy. We don't do for every patient. So let's say you see a patient in clinic and then you prescribe them for like that 
uh, levofloxacin therapy or either quadruple therapy. And then the patient came back positive again with you know, a positive urea breath test six weeks after the therapy, after being off from PPI. Then yes, in that case, you're like, oh, okay, they might be resistant to one of the antibiotics and you want to give them targeted therapy. So you do the biopsy and sensitivity. Thank you. So another question is, it's, uh, are Invisit tests also used to diagnose H. pylori? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we kind of touched on that at the moment. So that's the endoscopy biopsy. Um, so out of all the tests I would recommend, the non-invasive ones are the stool antigen test and the urea breath test. And then invasive would be um, endoscopic biopsy. Mm-hmm. Yep. So one of the audience asked the same questions and then I think that that may be the questions already asked. So here's another question sent to the right message. If patient's drug compliance is not good, uh, eradication therapy is not complete, how will you manage? Yeah, so that's a very difficult one. Um, so it, it depends what the causes of compliance. Um, the two main reasons I have seen is either financial, so patients unable to afford the medications. Um, and especially in Australia, some of these medications for two weeks come in like two boxes. So some patients might only buy one box because that's all they can afford and don't go back to buy the second box sometimes. Um, that's a difficult one to manage. And that kind of depends on your relationship with the patient to see how you can help them. Um, but I find that one always very difficult to help with. I think the other one, when it comes to side effects, um, we've got to be very careful with side effects because some of these therapies use four medications. And sometimes, you know, if a patient has, you know, a rash or vomiting after the medication, they might say, okay, I stopped it. And then they go to the doctor and they say, okay, I have, you know, uh, four allergies now to these four medications that I was taking. So we've got to kind of take a good history and, and kind of find out what happens. In so if someone is on, you know, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and, and a PPI, and they develop the rash, um, penicillins are very common to cause a rash. So that's probably the culprits, but you got to kind of, use a bit of clinical reasoning to, to figure out what, what to do. Um, and if, if, for example, nausea or vomiting are an issue, you, you got to kind of try and change some of the antibiotics around. Um, so some people react quite badly to tetracyclines um, and some people react really badly to bismuth. Uh, tetracyclines are quite important. People remain upright for a prolonged period of time. So sometimes that really helps. Um, but yeah, you got to really kind of tease out from, from the history and stuff why they were non-compliant um, or why they couldn't tolerate it. And then sometimes you got to try different antibiotics um, and it becomes really difficult when, when, so some people in clinic, for example, have three antibiotics they got nausea from and they, they really tried but couldn't take it. And they tried on Dancitron and metoclopramide to help with the nausea and they still couldn't take it. And then there's not really any medications left to give. Um, so sometimes you got to talk to them. And I think I saw a patient a couple months ago that we said, well, we have two antibiotics left um, that we can try and there's nothing else. We will try these for two weeks. And if we can't tolerate that, then we either don't treat the H. pylori. And the patient had to understand that comes with an, you know, a high risk of ulcers and then a, a potential risk of, of cancer. Um, and then unfortunately the patient didn't come back. So I don't know what happened after. Okay. Thank you, Shaw. So um, there's no questions to chat about. So can I ask you some questions? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, it, the radiation therapy, a mouse certainly is used as one of the radiation therapy. But I want to know why other penicillin does not use as eradication therapies like ampicillin or something like other 
penicillin? Mm -hmm. um, very good question. So this is back to pharmacology, which is, I looked this up a long time ago, I don't remember, but they, they looked at the pharmacology of, of some of the medication and they showed that the amoxicillin um, has the best bi-directional penetration in the gastric mucosa. Mm -hmm. and I don't fully remember what the, the logic is behind that. I just know it's the best one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and can I ask you one more question? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we have encountered so many patients with uh, dyspepsia, and some of them are young age, and mm -hmm. especially in our country. So, uh, there is any percentage uh, to have positivity uh, in those testing with uh, non acid dyspepsia? Any percentage yeah. of positivity? Yeah. So, this is a very uh, difficult question to answer. So, there's a. Um, so, when you look through the, the, the paper I tried to share, the, uh, I'll, I'll show it on the screen. Um, this one, when there, were, there was actually um, quite a large discussion. When, when do you decide to, 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 to even test for H. pylori um, in people with dyspepsia? And it's, it's quite difficult um, because they, in this working group, there's not a lot of evidence either way. So they've done some studies on this to try and see whether uh, if you have dyspepsia, you had an increased risk of H. pylori or not. Um, and it's quite difficult to find out. And they discuss quite a lot, and this is the fifth meeting, this paper, and even in the meetings before, they, they haven't reached a consensus. So at the moment, they don't recommend for or against, and it's kind of up to the clinician to use their clinical expertise to decide. Hmm. Yeah, can I interrupt about this? Mm -hmm. So from gastroenterology point of view, from our, our perspective, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry. So, you know, like uh, for our Queensland refer guideline, when you have a look at that. So if a patient uh, who is under the age of 50 and they have these, have these dyspeptic symptoms, before you refer for the endoscopy, you must, you know, like test for the H. pylori because H. pylori positivity can cause, uh, you know, dyspeptic symptoms, you know, interestingly, not reflux symptoms, dyspepsia only. And then, yeah, if the H. pylori is positive, then you have to treat H. pylori and uh, confirm uh, with the, you know, uh, test again for eradication and put them on PPI. If they fail PPI or if they have recurrent positivity of yeah, H. pylori, that's when you would consider for OGD, uh, you know, endoscopy. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, we still, you know, like, yeah, uh, we still do H. pylori a lot in the, uh, with our GP here. That's, we recommended the GP to do them as well. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, here's another question. Uh, after first H. pylori treatment, when to retest? Whether, it's, whether it is success or not? After yeah, the so, of treatment, yeah. So once they finish the therapy, you have to wait. Um, <laughs> at least four weeks so four weeks after the antibiotics to to test again with a urea breath test or or stool antigen um and you got to make sure they haven't used the ppi for at least uh two weeks as well so they have to be off ppi for two weeks and off antibiotics for four weeks and then you can check um what I generally do in the clinic is we'll see patients, you know, uh, day, day one, we, we give them the antibiotics, uh, which will be, you know, maybe one more day till they, till they go to the pharmacy and pick it up. Then they take the treatment for two weeks. And then I tell them, stop all the treatments, uh, stop the antibiotics after two weeks, stop the PPI after two weeks. And then I generally make an appointment with them in, in eight weeks time. And the reason I do eight weeks is that, you know, if they, there's a delay from the pharmacy or they didn't have money yet and they had to wait for their paycheck, it gives a little bit of extra time um, 
to make sure that you really have waited at least uh, four weeks after treatment to retest to make sure it wasn't a you know a false positive of, or after the test. <laughs> Okay, I think there will be no more questions. So, sure, thank you for your informative and comprehensive presentations, and thank you for joining us. And also, I would like to thank uh, Mami Nyakai for your active participations as well. And thank you. So, so if you have time, and uh, may I invite you to join us, sure. Okay, so um, the last, I would like to thank uh, our audience, our junior and senior colleagues for your active participation, for your questions. So bye bye and see you next sessions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. So much, for, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. That was a very, very good. Thank you very thank much. You. That was very that fun. Was yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye, Sean. Bye bye, guys. Thank you very much.